So dear colleagues, we will be just giving one minute for everyone to settle down. And then we'll start with our 90 seconds video and proceed with the agenda. Thanks for your patience and thanks for joining us today. Now it works. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, LGMA COP27 monthly webinars. This is the second version of 2022. Uh, my name is Yunus Arikan. I'm the Director of Global Advocacy at ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability, which is acting as the focal point of the LGMA constituency to the UNFCC, Local Governments and Municipal Authorities constituency. Um, I'm delighted to take you through the, the webinar today um, for a couple of uh, remarks. Um, first of all, you may have noticed that this webinar is recorded. We are later on uploading this in, on our YouTube channel. Um, we are uh, encouraging participants to give time for the, the first round of the presentations, and then we are opening the floor for Q&A, interventions, uh, remarks from partners, uh, participants of this call. Um, uh, there is one innovation that we are trying this time. Um, you, for those who are familiar, this is usually lasting for one hour, and we're particularly focusing on the climate negotiations and climate processes under the NFCC. However, uh, this year in 2022, we're expecting a, a stronger uh, synergy and collaboration with the, the biodiversity and nature related processes. Uh, and uh, a similar advocacy agenda is also run by um, ICLE, Cities Biodiversity Center and other partners on the biodiversity front. And we thought it would be good if, if these communities can hear and inform each other more effectively. Uh, and we thought uh, this could be one of the options for this uh, synergy could be that we have these webinars jointly uh, and we will try to test the first experience today. Um, my dear colleague Ingrid Kotze from the Cities Biodiversity Center will join us. So in order to enable uh, in, uh, ample time for all the discussions, um, we are expanding or extending this uh, webinar from one hour, uh, 60 minutes, to 90 minutes. Uh, and, and, and so that after the discussions or traditional agendas, items on uh, climate negotiations and Q&A, we will also give the floor for Ingrid. And Ingrid will take us through what's going on on the biodiversity agenda. Uh, and I think this will also enrich our discussions and uh, there 
after her presentation, we'll also open the floor for uh, Q&A, especially the topics that she presented. Uh, and I would like to also uh, acknowledge that this webinar is also within the spirit um, promoted in particular the biodiversity advocacy community, the Edinburgh partners, Edinburgh process partners and others, as well as other regular channels of ICLE and other partners. So. Um, with this in mind, um, uh, I hope uh, we will we will benefit from this innovation uh, in terms of efficiency and, and inspiration, and make sure that our advocacy positions are much better informed and developed together. Uh, so we will be looking forward to your feedbacks, whether this this is uh, fruitful or helpful, and if if this really proves to be good uh, way forward we could consider repl replicating such practices in the, the next monthly webinars um, throughout the year. Uh, and also for those um, who, who are aware, and in fact, this session will be repeated today at 4 p.m. in Central European time, uh, especially for the Western Hemisphere participants, and we will have the same discussions with them, and we will also get their feedbacks. So um, for, um, again, the agenda, and through this opportunity, well, I also would like to thank once again Ingrid and Cities Biodiversity Center and all the partners in the biodiversity advocacy space of the subnational governments. Um, for today, we will be taking us through some background on, on, on the NFCC and COP26 outcomes. Um, we will discuss for particularly some spent, spent some time on the G7 uh, 2022 German presidency. It was important, one of the most important things that has been uh, evolved uh, since our last webinar in, in January. Uh, and we will focus on our progress on towards COP27. Uh, um, for those who are not familiar, we are a constituency. We are the constituency of networks of local energy governments, which is a mechanism for their engagement in the UNFCC process. Uh, and this is a process since 1995 that ICLE has been the, the focal point. And in particular, since 2013, when we have collectively created the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments, uh, we are also representing the Global Task Force in these uh, negotiations, uh, as well as uh, biodiversity and the, the, the other uh, third Rio Convention, this is desertification. We are officially now in 30 plus networks accredited to UNFCC. But we are also reaching out to a broader community because we know uh, accreditation process may take some time and, and we would like to make sure that uh, inclusiveness is, is guaranteed through our mailings and, and, and communications. What exactly we're doing is mainly we are providing our inputs to the process. Uh, throughout the year, through the workshops, through interventions, but we are particularly very active at the COPs, uh, the climate uh, conference of the parties, uh, by convening our, our sessions, uh, side events, and in particular summits of local governments time to time if needed, um, or uh, convening our multi-level action pavilion, which will very likely become uh, the default, uh, especially building on our success at COP26, uh, which was one of the best uh, throughout this uh, 30 years. Um, this, this is also a summary of what we have achieved since 95, um, particularly on the way towards Copenhagen and beyond. We were much more ag aggressively involved in this process. Um, and, and these are all gave its brute fruits uh, because uh, at the UNFCC and Kyoto, we were not recognized, but in the Paris Agreement in 2015 and afterwards, we are much more involved in the process, and we have also made a, a major outcome. We will touch upon it in the Glasgow. Um, the video that you have seen is uh, was prepared for a celebration of the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement in 2021. Uh, we are busy for uh, making another short video based on our achievements in Glasgow because it opened a new phase, a new era, the second phase of the Paris Agreement starting. So hopefully we will have more refreshed uh, videos uh, and capturing of our moments. Um, meanwhile, you can uh, follow all the previous webinars in, the, in our web page, um, also YouTube channel, and also our, our uh, homepage uh, for uh, COP26 negotiations or also for the UNFCC negotiations, citiesandregions.org. Um, in the past, uh, this was uh, also very active through uh, an intense uh, engagement, and we hope, uh, obviously, this year it will be only several months, uh, unlike the last time it was for 24 months. Now we have less than 10 months to go towards COP27, so we'll see how we will manage the process. Uh, and here you can find the, the list of um, a calendar 
for uh, webinars monthly so throughout this year. Um, for COP26, let's remember, we said that the, the success of Glasgow depends on work at home. And we ask every nation to bring a new NDC along with the Paris Agreement uh, vision. But this time we said that since Paris Agreement recognized all levels of government, it has to be multi-level NDCs. The good news, we have more than 60 countries uh, from the global north and the global south who have made an increase in their ambition, either in their NDCs or in other documents. Uh, and we, we, would, we, we have noticed that these are all because they have been working with local engine governments. And we com com congratulate all these countries, but we also like to rely on them so that we, towards, uh, beyond COP26, we, we make this much more visible because Paris Agreement now confirms firmly that we are in the multi-level era. Um, it, at COP26, our home of uh, subnationals were was uh, in the blue zone it was it was uh, the multi-level action pavilion which was uh, a, a remarkable collaboration across uh, all networks uh, and, and partners especially hosted by scottish government as our core host uh, together with icle but we had several co-hosts and, and many partners in this process at the beginning of cop 26 we have announced our roadmap, uh, the time for multi-level action. Uh, based on this vision, we have made several outcomes at COP26. Let's re recall ourselves. What were the main outcomes? Uh, on the Glasgow Climate Act Pact, uh, official de de decision, uh, those who should be aware that, in fact, Glasgow Climate Pact refers to three different documents, but there are many paragraphs similar, especially under the UNFCC and the Paris Agreement. Most important uh, outcome for us was that the term multi-level is for the first time in the UNFCC official outcomes. Uh, this was a remarkable mobilization of LGMA constituency on site in the Glasgow uh, Blue Zone, but also virtually all uh, colleagues who were not even there in present helped us to reach to the national delegation so that this text and others references have been inserted to the to the outcomes as appropriate. Um, we are very happy Marrakesh partnerships also extended. Constituencies are recognized for the first time. There are even a good reference to youth participation in local decision making, which we're already experiencing through climate emergence declarations. And obviously, uh, for the first uh, cycle of NDCs, uh, which was expected to continue with the second NDCs in the uh, Glasgow and the third to come uh, on five years later. But Glasgow asks all nations to bring a new NDC by the end of 2022. This will not continue every year. Therefore, the submission of NDCs this year, revised NDCs, are important. Also, in relation that so many announcements were done in in Glasgow, uh, many commitments, and none of them are in the in the, the NDCs at the moment. Uh, we still don't see how our commitments under Race to Zero, Race to Resilience are in the NDCs. So a, a new NDC this year is particularly important so that these are now part of the official commitments of the national governments. This is the only way to ensure continuity. This is the only way to ensure tracking that we are making progress. Uh, otherwise, it would be just uh, written on, on, on water, uh, but, but some in events in Glasgow, which is not the spirit of uh, the climate emergency. Uh, on the climate finance, we have particularly focused on non-market approaches because we thought this was an opportunity to bring sustainable urbanization as a non-market approach, especially for developing countries. And the good news is that the reference to, to local context, a subnational context, is in the Article 6.8. And now it's us for us to feed into more information so that in the final list of non-market approaches, we can see integrated sustainable urban and territorial de development. And it's now the process has kicked off. This year, there will be negotiations. So it's just starting. Let me give one example. In the 97 uh, Kyoto Protocol, flexibility mechanisms, uh, clean development mechanisms, joint implementation, emissions trading, were all referenced with only one sentence. So the one paragraph in multi-level or one sentence or one word in multi-level and these subsequent references to local and subnational in the non-market approaches, in fact, if we can use it effectively, this can open a huge new door for us or a new window for us that to really take us to a multi-level and ambitious climate action. Finally, one of the biggest outcomes of, of um, 
the last goal uh, is uh, action for climate empowerment. This is addressing Article 6 of UNFCC and Article 6, 12 of Paris Agreement, which is education, youth, uh, training, uh, public participation, public awareness, and public access to information. Uh, this is now a new work program on the Glasgow work program, and it has numerous references to local Indian governments, which is extremely valuable tool for us so that we, then we can advance uh, our work, especially connecting climate action to the climate negotiations. Other than that, there were several LGMA-led or LGMA-relevant initiatives. We had, uh, in addition to Pavilion, our roadmap, we have made sure thousands of cities and regions are committed to race to zero and race to resilience. We had delivered 12 uh, interventions, more than 12 interventions. Uh, there were announcements on finance, um, Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration was announced. Edinburgh biodiversity process was very visible at least at the mountain level action pavilion. Uh, a number of commitments have come up from Scotland and Wallonia. We will follow up on that. Um, US, Japan, US, China announcements came up on subnational interventions. Uh, and and we, the GCOM has released a, a, an impact report and multi level action playbook. So that was how we finished in, in Glasgow a couple of months ago. Uh, obviously, this year will be ambitious to deliver more progress on that. But there is something that came up surprise or unexpected. In fact, um, the, the, the German government was watched or was followed by all the global partners because of the new coalition, including the Greens um, and Social Democrats and, and the Liberals, um, which were expected to be much more ambitious. Um, and in fact, it, nobody was surprised that they have already made commitments that they will elevate German ambition. But for a good uh, coincidence, that is also the beginning of the German G7 presidency this year. Uh, G7 is the group of nations. Um, and we'll see now who, which, which are they. Uh, for the first time in the history of G7, the agenda by the presidency includes so many impressive, unprecedented reference to cities and urbanization across the document. This is remarkable because there were always an expectation that those countries who are developed should take the lead and, and they are now hopefully will respond to this program of the German government. And this will also hopefully feed into G20. Uh, we have seen in G20 in the past some efforts, uh, but um, as of today, we still don't know the Indonesian presidency program. Therefore, having this visibility uh, in the G7 uh, in 2022 presidency program is extremely encouraging us and it's a, a valuable tool for all of us. I will not go into the details of all this text here, but it is unprecedented. We will work on it later on. Um, here is a, a slide. In fact, this visual is listing all the G7 countries, which are they, which are the ones who will be attending those in terms of their decision-making role. So these are the countries who will decide. Of course, they interact with others, but these are the countries that are responsible for success or failure of G7. Uh, for each of those countries, in fact, there are numerous uh, relations that on the cities and urbanization. Canada uh, is, 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 is there, and this is impressive. There is a special annex with all provinces and reference to local governments. Um, in fact, urbanization is a theme of, of, of um, uh, under the provinces, not the federal government. So it will be interesting to see that. Uh, and we have important figures like Jean Lemire, our colleague from Quebec, who is also actively involved in the Canadian uh, delegation. And in fact, Canada is the, 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 the key country who has entered this text in the Paris Agreement preamble. So we are always in, uh, in looking forward to have more engagement from Canada. US, you all know, uh, with the Biden administration, uh, we have a strong NDC with, at the beginning top of it, it says that if cities and states didn't take action, the US will not be able to raise ambition. We have a secretary of housing within the US administration, John Kerry, of course, is, 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 is a figure that knows very well the cities and engagement. Um, uh, that, but U.S. also has special agreements with Japan and China for subnational uh, collaboration. And so that, these are all positive inputs. France, obviously, they are the custodian of the Paris Agreement. There is a special ministry of territorial cohesion and relations with local government. Obviously, the, the importance of France is that they are leading the EU presidency in this first six months of the 2022, so that they can help very effectively or collaborate with Germany. 
Uh, but but of course, like every year, every country has such such challenges. They are going through a presidential election this year, so we'll see how French uh, stakeholders will find time to deal with pr the, the, all these topics. It will be an intense year for them. Japan, uh, we have been working with them for a long while. Uh, they have been working with local government since 96, uh, Kyoto Protocol legacy. There is a special minister of internal affairs. They have a pro promising commitment for decentralization. They have hosted the redesigned platform. They are committed to decarbonization domino. In 2016, they have hosted the first G7 environment ministers and mayors forum. Uh, and in 2022, three, they will be the G7 president. So, so Japan will continue to play a key role and it, it, we will also see uh, their agenda this year again. Italy, former uh, G20 presidency, uh, there's a minister of interest infrastructure and there's so many different ministers referring to local governments. So let's see how this will engage into the process. Uh, and the, Italy is also very uh, prominently supporting the, the urban agenda because under G20, they have created a new uh, working group on intermediate cities. Germany, of course, we have discussed, there is an interesting thing going on. There's a new minister of urbanization in Germany, in the new government. Jennifer Morgan is assigned as the climate envoy which is from the climate activist community, and it's very familiar with the cities as well. Uh, and in fact, the current councillor of, of Germany is the former mayor of Hamburg or governor of Hamburg, which is a unique feature that we have to benefit. Uh, EU is, is, is part of the process. Uh, of course, DG Regio, in addition to climate and environment, is the one that is dealing with the urban development. Mr. Timmermans, the vice president of EU, is also the, the co-chair of GCOM, so it's a strong partner. And finally, the UK, there is a dedicated minister of local governments. Uh, we also have a devolved administration in the UK. They are definitely carrying the COP26 legacy. Uh, the current prime minister, mayor, former mayor of London, uh, Boris Johnson, this played a huge role because while we were in the last hours, uh, we have particularly addressed to him that he has a responsibility to support his fellow former mayors. And I think this, this found its way because the, the final text has incorporated our proposals. Um, in, in the UK, we have an Urban 7 legacy uh, through Core Cities UK, Edinburgh Process and Biodiversity, and Glasgow legacy. So all these are, of course, very promising. And of course, the biggest news is that for the first time, there will be in September, a sustainable urban development ministerial in Potsdam on the, in, in, in Germany. Uh, in May, there will be numerous ministerials and in between, uh, there will be the heads of state summit in June. So this will be the agenda that we will be seeing and watching. Um, and if we look at the, the, the advocacy of LGMA, uh, we could definitely say that we are not at, at point zero in the G7 agenda. In 2016, Ministry of Environment of Japan hosted the first Environment and, and, and Mayors Forum, which was really prominent in terms of its outcomes. In Bonn, at the, the, the COP23, the Bonn-Fiji commitment particularly referred that we want to engage in G20, G7 process as well. And last year, Core Cities UK convened the first Urban 7 Summit, uh, which was asking to become an official engagement group under the Urban 7, the G7 process. Uh, the good news is that uh, this, this, this efforts are, are all now building up. Um, and because now it is in the shoulders of the German partners, we're expecting that the German Deutsche Stadtetag, the German Association of Cities, will come up with some new announcements just in a couple of days ahead so that we can comfortably start to plan how we will be engaging in this process. As you have seen, it's a very busy agenda. It's very hectic in May. But we have also an opportunity for a states summit and also uh, this was heads of state summit in G7 in June, but also the first urbanization ministerial and, and as well in, in September. So that was um, G7. And now let's focus on COP27. Um, COP27 is really working progress. Um, the host, the, the main incoming uh, responsible uh, presidency delegation is now assigned their Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Egyptian government has decided that the Minister of Foreign Affairs will be the COP president. He's now announced as COP president designate, and he will only be called COP president when COP starts. Parties will elect him. Uh, there is a special 
assignment, the Minister of Environment, Ms. Fuad, uh, is now announced as the Ministerial Coordination and Spatial Climate Envoy. This has not been practiced before, so we will see how this will be rolling out. And we are still waiting for the Egyptian government to assign their high-level climate action champion, which will be working with Nigel Topping. Uh, we have seen a very effective synergy between Gonzalo Munoz and Nigel Topping. We'll look, we hope similar collaboration could continue. Meanwhile, COP26 presidents will continue to take the lead. And in particular, since Egypt is still trying to finalize their preparations, presidency, UK presidency is really making sure the bridge is, is, is continuing so that the initiatives, the outcomes are, are followed up uh, to the extent possible. Uh, one important thing um, among the, the several engagement groups that uh, the, the COP27, COP26 presidency has created, there is one special one uh, which is Friends of COP. Uh, in this uh, community, it was Mayor Eric Garcetti, Mayor of Los Angeles and C40 Chair. Uh, we're aware he's now stepping down because of he's now assigned as the new ambassador to U of US to India. We have to check who will be replacing him or if he still stays there in his personal capacity, who will be representing uh, local and regional governments and preferably actively elected, those who are in, in, in the office today, as of this year. Um, obviously, uh, because uh, Mayor Garcetti was the chair of C40, there is discussions between the COP presidency and the C40. We are informed about this. Um, and of course, the C40 chair is mayor of London. That, that makes also perfect sense so that he's engaged under the UK presidency. Uh, so we will, we will hear hopefully soon, uh, maybe we could even think about an additional seat so that it is not just um, one person, but maybe we could ask for more seats um, and that could and strengthen our, our efforts. In fact, uh, the UK uh, COP26 president announced uh, the vision of the UK in, in the 2022 uh, and the emphasis was delivering on the Glasgow Climate Pact. I have particularly underlined this because this will now feed into our LGMA proposals. Our LGMA motto was already starting to be discussed, but you would see that there's a perfect match about what LGMA wants to do and what COP26 presidency the only wants to do. The only, let's say, pity thing, if, if you look at this text and the, 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 the speech he has delivered at the Chatham House, there was, no, almost, there was almost no reference to cities and multi-level action, uh, which is a pity. But we hope this could be improved in, in the, the years, in the months ahead. Uh, we know Alok Sharma has very been actively supporting our, our efforts. Uh, let's, let's take this as like um, uh, a, 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 a small roadmap accident. And hopefully in the next future engagements, Alok Sharma could speak more about cities and regions and multi-level action. So here is what we have agreed over the past couple of months. Um, we are aiming to go from uh, multi-level action, time for multi-level action to multi-level action delivers. As you can see, multi-level action delivers is fully aligned with the COP26 presidency. We have four main blocks, enhancing multi-level indices, delivering the unfinished business on climate emergency, convening the first ever climate and urbanization ministerial at COP, and empowering Africa as well as Mediterranean and Middle East and uh, I mean North Africa region. Um, in that sense, you can see, of course, these are just headlines. Inside, there are a lot of efforts that we have to lead on. First of all, we have to ask nations to bring new indices with our commitments involved, local and regional determined contribution. We have to work with the parliamentarians so that we make sure this multi-level is, is not just uh, the executive government, but legislative bodies and judicial bodies even. We have to energize UNFCC Friends of Multi-Level Action. In terms of climate emergency, we have to be aware that there are a lot of topics that was untouched or un uncovered at the Glasgow COP. Therefore, in that sense, COP26 was not a response to climate emergency, but of course it was an important step of stone so that Paris climate agreement survives in its second phase. Second phase is important because even Kyoto Protocol could not manage to survive in the second phase. On paper, it is there, but in practice, it was not serious. So how to expect a, a climate emergency? So there are topics that speaks to the heart of Africa, that speaks hard to the global south. Food, nature, adaptation, culture, finance. 
circular economy, 1.5 degree lifestyles, blue economy, buildings, mobility, waste and consumption, energy. These are the topics that if we can bring them and if we can work with the presidency, COP26 presidency, that they put this on the agenda, we can expect a huge change, a mindset change. And that's why it's important that we, we bring back these topics. And we know urbanization is a dire topic for Africa. Africa is the world's fastest growing urbanization community. It's the youngest continent as well. Um, so we are hopeful this will pay off. Um, so we are keeping our fingers crossed. And in that sense, we are already started to discuss with the COP26 to 7 presidency teams. Migration and loss and damage will be a key topic, uh, building on what Scotland and Wallonia has announced. But we also know migration is a huge topic this year, also in the other UN fora, where uh, the Global Task Force is also leading. And uh, within the scope, we should probably explore how we can connect Climate Vulnerable Forum. Uh, the topic of climate and urbanization ministerial would become much more serious once we have G7 urbanization ministerial. So with the wave, with, with the momentum from G7, we can bring really this dream to come true at COP27. And one final comment. Um, this connects once again, the mission of COP26 and the mission of COP27. Let's remember COP26 was in fact a, a remarkable moment that it opened the second episode or second phase of the Paris Agreement. So it is the second phase of the Paris Agreement. But if you look, make an analogy, it's the second episode of climate action. However, how can we make sure COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh can be the second season for climate emergency? It's, it's a complete new way of work under the climate uh, negotiation and climate processes because we have to go in the emergency mode. We cannot continue business as usual. And the multi-level action delivers. The motto of LGMA can help this. Here are the legal, let's say, legitimate backgrounds for us. A Paris Agreement, Preamble Paragraph, Glasgow Climate Pact. But one example, again, look at the UNFCC Article 2. This is the agreed language in 1992. It has a very specific text on food. But under the UNFCC, there is no program directly addressing food. Yes, there's something on agriculture, but agriculture and food are not the same thing. And particularly, if you look at that, there has been a UN Food System Summit in 2021, where we had also been working very much with African partners. I think we have a huge opportunity to advance on food as like one of the new themes that will come as a legacy of Sharm el And in, good news is that immediately after COP26 is closed, uh, Minister Fuad convened, was part of a dialogue on the Food Systems Summit uh, team. She mentioned about the importance of food. Uh, Mayor of Izmir, uh, ICLEI Global Executive Committee, and one of the Champions Network members have also addressed that we would be strong on food. So these are elements that if we can bring, we can create the structure correctly, we can come up with a very good outcomes. So we are still discussing now the revised, uh, revamping, reloading of LGMA governance. We are suggesting to have a string committee. We'd like to have regional groups, thematic groups, and working groups uh, for COP. Um, we were committing that after the first last webinar in January, in February, January, sorry, we would be sharing with you some shared documents. Unfortunately, we could not deliver our commitment on that front yet. However, we are now aware the submission phase is starting. So there are several deadlines. For example, uh, February and March are the, the closest one. In fact, one of the deadlines were already over last, it was yesterday. However, if we follow the logic we have developed so far, we could ask our partners to take the lead in drafting our position papers. And even we are late on, on, on the goal on adaptation, I assume if we can submit it by 28th of February, along with other text, we could still make ourselves heard. And in that sense, um, I know uh, we have been receiving inputs from Regions 4, UN Capital Development Fund. Um, they have already expressed their interest to lead our work on adaptation and, and finance, in particular on Article 6.8. ICLE, uh, World Secretary, as, as the, the lead on focal point, will hopefully also be uh, leading the, the process. But 
this is not only on us. Um, so there will be several other agenda items coming up on ACE, on Global Goals, on Tiago Network, on Loss and Damage, Adaptation Fund. So the, the way we are now designing our LGMA under the thematic groups, regional groups, and LGMA COP working group makes perfect sense. Let's remember, we could focus on our thematic working groups on three main categories. The bodies of the UNFCC, Adaptation Fund, Green Climate Fund, Technology Center, the processes, processes on ACE, Nairobi, Platform of the Indigenous People, Capacity Building Hub, Innovation Hub, Santiago Network, Warsaw Mechanisms, Adaptation Committee, Youth uh, and Just Transition. And we have to be much more advancing on uh, the Global Climate Action. Uh, as particularly Global Climate Action is now part of the Global Stock Take. So, we have to make more progress on our thematic pathways, race to zero, race to resilience, breakthroughs, uh, thematic breakthroughs, NASCA and regional climate weeks. For regional groups, we're already seeing now and the upcoming uh, European Climate Conference, uh, Committee of the Regions, uh, together with Climate Change and others, will take the lead on positioning LGMA firmly in, 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 in that uh, conference. Uh, we are checking now with our partners in Africa uh, they are already being actively involved in the EU Africa Summit or EU Africa Week. This is happening this this week. In in, in other countries, again, we can start to step up. Um, Japan will be hosting another session, and then there will be a lot of dialogue with US. And COP twenty six, uh, COP twenty seven working group uh, with, in relation with the presidencies, constituency focal points, um, host city, country, and city region relations. We have already started our dialogues with the governorate of South Sinai. So it's, it's really promising that we are advancing on that. And in fact, here is just a screenshot of the headers of our statements that were delivered at the COP26. You can see we have used a fixed template that we referred to Global Task Force and ICLE as the overall focal point. We have mentioned our cities and regions logo, LGMA logo, and everyone who delivered the intervention be it a network, be it a city, we have put their logo, we have put their names, and these are now giving them much more ownership, much more visibility, and we could consider similar so that if there is a submission of LGMA, say on adaptation, we could say that this is drafted by, example, Regions 4, um, in collaboration with, of course, LGMA, Focal Point, ICLE, but other working group members on the adaptation. The same can go to um, ACE, the same can go to others, so that we can develop our both vision and, and, and systematic work so that our efforts are both valuing the efforts that our partners have delivered based on their voluntary contributions, but also make it more systematic. Um, on the COP27 working group, we haven't made too much progress yet, but we had a call with the COP26 seven presidency uh, Minister of Environment Advisors. Uh, the, the COP27 presidency team is now in Bonn. They are having consultations with the UNFC Secretariat. And I think we could speed up in, on the coming weeks, especially that EU Africa um, week is also over, so that all these partners that we have been working on now, we could convene next week probably that we can get together what has been advanced, what is the prospects for, for the work, so that we can scale up our efforts. Um, so with this, I'm now concluding. I will not go into all the details of, of this agenda because I would like to particularly uh, have this discussion also once we hear from Ingrid, the biodiversity agenda that she will take us through. But we can come back to this. So this we can keep this slide on, but at least at this stage, I know it was around 35 minutes or even 40 minutes of uh, a monologue, which may not be so easy to follow, but let's give a break and I can take a sip of my tea. And in the meantime, maybe if there are any colleagues who want to intervene, please uh, raise your hand or type in the chat box or type in the Q&A box so that we can hear your voice as well. Um, yeah, I let me look at our attendees. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. I see a lot of newcomers as well. So feel free if you want to address any point, if you want to fill any missing information, if you ask for any clarification question, 
Um, if there are any updates you want to share that we have not managed to capture here, uh, you're more than welcome. If not, but we can immediately, of course, continue with Ingrid and we can have another debate afterwards, which may even be even easier. And in the meantime, feel free to type in your inputs into the chat box or, or the Q&A box as well. So Ingrid, uh, welcome uh, and, and many thanks for joining us. Um, I will ask my colleagues to give you the, the screen sharing mode and I will stop my screen. Thank you, Eunice. And this is really, I think, um, a very exciting moment. I hope everybody can see my screen. Good. Let me just put it on. Come on, it needs to go. There you are. Um, I think it's really great that we are combining these discussions and the exchange of information, because if there's one thing that certainly from a biodiversity perspective came out of the um, last climate COP, um, is the, the closer that, you know, how these conventions are moving closer. And I know it is something that within the biodiversity convention, they are pushing very strongly. So I think this is really very strategic of ICLI to, to do this this way. So what I, what I thought I would do is I'm just going to really try and bring everybody up to speed on the uh, biodiversity process. It's been a very protracted one which started in 2018. It was should have been concluded already um, in 2020, 2020, but obviously because of COVID couldn't be. And how the convention and the parties then ran the process was to hold a series of informal and sometimes formal, um, but all virtual, all online um, sessions. And the agreement was that these would not be considered as negotiations. Um, although they did review text and they made certain sort of recommendations and they put things in brackets and all of that, it was always very clear that it wasn't um, going to be a formal negotiation. We are now finally at the point where we can, um, within the next um, month or so, um, in March, there will be um, the resumed meetings of um, the two subsidiary bodies, which is the subsidiary body on scientific, technical and technological advice. Um, as well as the one on implementation. And then the third one is obviously the intersessional body that was set up, which is a working group specifically um, to develop and negotiate the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And the idea is that here um, the, they will be in person um, and it's primarily to complete the work that has been done up to now. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and to engage in full negotiations and then come up with um, the final documents and the recommendations of those three bodies um, will include also draft decisions and there is um, also a recommendation for a draft decision um, from the subsidiary body on implementation that speaks specifically to, to multi-level governance and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, so the modalities of the meeting are, are really interesting. Um, there have, um, it's in person, but they've had to limit the capacity. Um, so it's six per party and then two per observer organization. Uh, it was uh, earlier this year, or, or it was actually late last year, they had a slightly bigger a sort of in-person uh, delegation recommendation, but they've reduced that now. Um, and they have then said that there will be virtual facility as well, which is unlimited. The idea is it is going to be obviously interactive, it's negotiation, so we need that participation. There will be opportunities for speaking in both the plenary sessions as well as the contact groups, but that is limited only to the people that are present in the meeting. And that was an important consideration specifically that the parties had, that they wanted it to be real negotiations. Um, they've also cautioned that depending on what actually happens in March and the situation with COVID, they may, um, although the, the delegations are six per party and two per observer, they may on the day in the venue also make further limitations. Um, and um, the one thing that they have said, they are sort of cognizant of the fact that some countries may have limitations, travel limitations imposed on them as a result of COVID waves flaring up. And if that is the case, what they would do is they would allow virtual 
um, interactive participation at special request. But otherwise, every person that is participating online has viewer mode only. So they cannot, you know, they cannot make statements and they cannot engage in the discussions. They can follow all the sessions, but they can't participate. Um, it's an intense time. It's just under three weeks and they're basically having to consolidate what normally would have been uh, SBI, uh, SAPSTA two week block, as well as then another two week block for the open ended working group. They would have, you know, we've had to condense this all into to three weeks. So you'll see from the program, it looks a bit like a dog's breakfast, but basically how they're going to run it is to hold meetings concurrently. Um, to allow um, sort of time for all of the documents they need, you know, the non-papers, the conference room papers, the limited documents, all of those things and their consideration. Um, and they will be running uh, contact groups and they're going to do it in a way so that the contact groups that deal with the same sort of topic in the, the technical um, subsidiary body and in the implementation subsidiary body, don't over, they don't duplicate it, they don't clash. Um, but you'll see there basically the color coding, um, coding is, um, the blue is for the technical meetings, the brown is the implementation meetings, working group is in green, um, and then all of the white areas um, is where they have what they call contact groups, and those will go per agenda. The specifics around the contact group have not been finalized. Obviously, it will depend on the progress with the in the plenary sessions, um, as far as they you know as far as they get. In some cases, it may not be necessary to have a contact group, but there have been um, at the previous um, formal sessions, the, the online sessions, there were some contact groups that were already established then with specific um, objectives that they had to meet. So those would need to continue and, and to take place. Um, they will allow um, opening comments to be opening statements to be made in the, subs the sort of joint plenary, where after the subsidiary bodies and the open-ended working group will have their own meetings. Um, but they're not envisaging that there would then be statements, opening statements in the subsidiary bodies. The idea is to consolidate it all into the main opening plenary, and that is open only for the regional groups and for the major groups. They've indicated that parties and observers um, would not get an opportunity. Um, fortunately, local government is recognized as one major group, so we are expecting and we will be preparing a statement. Um, and then just very quickly, the important thing about this um, session is that there is a draft decision, which is a renewal of the decision that was agreed to in 2010. It's a more ambitious one, and it includes a new plan of action, which is also a lot more ambitious. It, um, it was tabled originally by the UK government um, as a result of the Edinburgh process, where ICLEI played a, a leading role, both strategically and technically. Um, and there has been really good support uh, from a number of countries, including the EU bloc, um, various African countries, South American countries, the Asian countries, etc. Um, however, there are some rather tricky questions around implementation of the plan of action um, from certain countries, uh, Canada being one of them. And so there is an anticipation. I mean, we hope that this is going to go through, um, but there is an anticipation that it may, as a result of the questions that the Canadians and the, the Argentinians also had some questions, um, that it may um, result in a contact group. We're hoping not. Uh, the Canadians are sort of um, recommending that it does not it's more, it's not adopted for implementation, it's more for encouragement, um, but we're trying to push the stronger word of adopt, endorse, and all of those things. And, and there's a lot of support for that from obviously the UK, the EU. So there's going to be a lot of lobbying that's happening um, around that. Um, and essentially what it does is to, and it's really important because for the first time, um, it allows for um, a real, recognition and optimization of subnational governments, all levels of subnational governments in terms of both the implementation as well as reporting and making those links very strongly between the framework and its targets, the national biodiversity strategies and action plans, which are the equivalents of the NDCs, um, 
and also, you know, around improving uh, coordination, um, not just at a global level, but specifically in country uh, at a multilateral level. Um, and then I think the important thing is that it provides tools and, and resources and platforms for facilitating local and subnational action on biodiversity. Um, and one of the critical things there is that we have under the action area, which is called monitoring and reporting, we have recognition of by the CBD of the cities with nature and the regions with nature platforms as being the place the mechanism where um, sub-national governments will share their commitments, keeping in mind that these are voluntary commitments, but they'll share those commitments, they will monitor progress against their commitments, and they will report on them, and that, that will feed into, on the one hand, the review of the national biodiversity strategies and action plans, but also very importantly into the country reports um, that are required and under the convention. Um, I think the other significance of, of this particular conference room paper, which we call CRPH, which is around the subnational engagement, is that it provides a very systematic and comprehensive mechanism for multi-level governance. Um, and it's been something that's been around for 2010. Um, and there's no other um, example in, within the family of Rio Convention. So this is really something that we don't want to lose because that would be a serious step backward. And that's why adoption is really what we're going for. It's not good enough just to recognize or to whatever. Um, the other thing that is important, and this is obviously a very strong selling point, is that it does support state parties. It's, it's a framework, it's not taking away any powers, um, but it is recognizing that cities and provinces and, and states um, are agents of government. They are part of government. They may not be the sovereign you know, a, a signatory to the convention, but they are very much important parts of government. Um, and then I think the other thing that's interesting um, has been in their reflection from the open-ended working group, um, the co-chairs reflection, looking back and sort of looking forward now to the Geneva um, thing, in their statement, they've made it very clear um, that implementation happens at the local and landscape escape level, and that the parties can benefit from harnessing their, their local and subnational governments. So just quickly um, on the, the the global biodiversity framework itself. Um, there's a number of places where there is provision or reference to multi-level governance, um, not always to our liking strong enough or, or clear enough. Sometimes there's a bit of ambiguity, um, but for example, the theory of change is based on this whole, whole of government approach, also whole of society. And we're pushing that whole of government is not just seen as uh, as a horizontal um, mechanism, but that it is a multi-level uh, mechanism and asking for a clear definition because there is some ambiguity. And if you look at the document, you'll see that there's, you know, they don't always refer to whole of government and reference subnationals in the same way. Sometimes they're excluded, sometimes they're, they are included. The other thing is that there's a lot of focus, obviously, on implementation and recognition there that it is um, something that needs to be done in partnership um, with uh, 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 local governments um, and subnational governments. As far as the targets are concerned, there is a specific target that speaks to cities and it talks about um, access and um, you know, to green and blue spaces for human health and well-being, um, et cetera. Um, but we're pushing for a strengthening of that, and I'll talk about that a little bit more now, but what I think is also important is that there needs to be a recognition that it's not just that one target out of the 21 or 23 targets, that in fact many of these targets are either dependent upon or can be supported by action that is taken in our cities and in the provinces. Um, and then also the good news is that um, from, a, from the, the section that deals with enabling conditions, there is a very strong reference to the Edinburgh Declaration, which refers to the plan of action as part of the, um, the sort of instruments and mechanisms for enabling. And I think that if we look at the, the topics that are coming out that are going to be discussed, and, and I think where there will be quite a lot of hot debate, um, there's still you know, I think generally the, the point has been made and it's clear that there's general 
widespread support for the framework. Uh, it's not that it's up for, for grabs, it's, you know, the principles, people are happy with it. Obviously, the devil is in the detail. Um, the, the other things that I think that are very strong that people agree about is the links to the, the SDGs, how this uh, framework can support the, also the achievement of the SDGs. As I said earlier, the links to the climate convention. Um, the, you know, one of the big things that people feel there's a gap is specifically around, it doesn't recognize the current status enough. And there is a proposal um, to incorporate the current status. And that's obviously something that's going to be discussed. There is a whole sort of, you know, as, as integral to the, the theory of change. And things then that are really also being discussed quite deeply are things like the milestones. Some countries feel they're not strong enough. Other countries feel they're too far. You know, they're too, too, the milestones are too ambitious. Indicators, a lot of discussion is going to be around that. There's big concern about the implementation for, um, time frames. This has to do with things like funding, particularly for the developing countries, uh, capacity, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course, a lot of emphasis, and I think this is a lesson that we've learned the need for a really strong and robust monitoring and reporting framework. And that is why, as I said earlier, the cities with nature and regions with nature platforms um, are so, so important. Um, the one thing that I think is particularly relevant also to this audience, particularly if we're talking with um, our climate hats on, is the discussion around nature-based solutions. Um, there are several and very strong countries that are concerned about the use of nature-based solutions versus ecosystem-based adaptation, which is a terminology and an approach which is accepted and it has been adopted within the CBD there's a range of concerns. I'm not going to go into that now, but one of the primary ones is that um, th there has been you know, experience and there is a concern about nature-based solutions not being strong enough and not really supporting and, and protecting biodiversity. And there have been cases where there has been biodiversity loss as a result of that. So that is obviously something that is going to be hotly debated. The EU bloc, for example, are very pro nature-based solutions, but then there are other countries, um, a lot of them in South America, within Africa, um, that, are, are, that have raised really serious concerns. Um, a lot of interesting debate on target 12, which is the one that I've talked about just now, saying that it should not just be about access or area increase, but that it should also be about the quality of those spaces, green and blue, um, and how that can support mental health, um, et cetera. And then some of the things that are beginning to sort of raise their head also a lot stronger are things like uh, human rights based approaches and, and uh, sort of lenses. This is something that's particularly driven by a lot of the IPLCs, um, a lot of a lot more emphasis on health and specifically the one health approach. Um, and yeah, so there's a number of, of other things. Um, and I think before I end my presentation, I just wanted to touch very briefly on UNEA 5.2 and its associated meetings, which is coming up now. I'm not going to go into detail. And I think as Eunice indicated, um, definitely in our next um, webinar, we'll focus a lot more on the substantive, the content stuff that's coming out of UNEA because that's happening now as of next week till the end of Feb, early March. Um, but it's been really interesting that this discussion around uh, nature-based solutions also came out there. There's a lot of concern, um, a, a lot of reservations around whether you know people understand its value and they understand why it's making such inroads in the climate space, but there have been uh, certain reservations um, raised there as well. So uh, just a quick um, overview. We've got um, a series of many meetings now. The open-ended committee on permanent representatives is the first to kick off next week. Then you know 5.2 starts, and that's from uh, um, also from the 28th till the second. There's an, a huge variety of side events and other meetings that are happening. Um, last week we had the preparations of the global major groups and the stakeholders. And I've just put up a quick slide on the sort of major, you know, the resolutions that are coming out. So there's one cluster that looks at specifically the topic of plastic pollution. Then there's uh, quite a few that deal with um, 
the sort of more nature topics, and that's a loose conglomeration of things. It's like lake management, um, again, the one on nature-based solutions, animal welfare and biodiversity and health. Interestingly enough, that has come from African country. Um, and then there are a series of resolutions that deal with chemicals and waste, a lot of concern around that issue as well. Um, there's a cluster of, of resolutions that deal specifically um, with the green recovery infrastructure. And then the last group of resolutions deal more with the, the more sort of generic things, the global environment outlook, um, and then just looking at the more sort of institutional side of, of things. So that in a nutshell is what we're looking forward to. I think the next basically as from, from next Monday till the end of March is going to be a really busy, very interesting time. And hopefully in our next March um, webinar, I will be in Geneva and um, Ganea will have been done and dusted. So there's going to be some very, very interesting substantive feedback that we can hopefully give you then. And I think that's it. I need to stop sharing. Uh, I just want to- Ingrid, give the things. you want yeah. to mention about the Cities and Regions Summit at UNEA? Five, uh, which is on the 23rd oh, yes, of February. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I actually made a note and then I forgot. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Yes, that's important. There's a, it's on the 23rd of February. It's, it's, there's two slots. There's a morning slot and there's an afternoon slot, which is a very high level summit on cities and regions. Um, and there's going to be a number of very interesting uh, plenary discussions. I can um, maybe share the link. In fact, we've been asked to share the link, so I will put that in the in the comment box. Um, but we've got um, uh, in the plenary we have um, people, representatives, political representatives from ICLE, such as Governor Dosal, which who who leads our biodiversity portfolio, uh, Mayor Plant, who's the uh, global ambassador specifically with the CBD from for ICLE. Um, there's a number of mayors. Um, that are members of ICLE, but also other organizations, for example, C40, UCLG. So it's the, it's the who's who of, of um, networks and also um, really high level um, political speakers and also from, from, from UNEP that's going to be running that. So I think the easiest for me is just to put the link in yeah. and then to encourage so, people to, to uh, join just, that as well. Just, just for a good additional remark on the UNEA, uh, as local authorities major group, we have the capacity to deliver our statement at the beginning of the session, and mm -hmm. ICLE and UCLG are coordinating the local authorities. Your sound. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Regions 4 is also part of this, this group, um, so we will be coordinating so that uh, at the beginning of the, the UNIA, we will tab table our, our statement, especially, especially on on um, nature, but also plastics and other agendas of UNA5. And of course, um, uh, then we will discuss with our partners. I mean, the, the, the biggest advantage of UNEA uh, Cities and Regions Summit is, is, is convened with UNEP. And, and it will be uh, also have additional opportunities to feed into the process, the multi-stakeholder dialogues. Hopefully, some ministers will refer as an outcome of this uh, the documents. And of course, the discussion will continue throughout the year on the nature related process, which is in May. Uh, so I think uh, Ingrid, you, you mentioned it because the or officially, if you look at the official calendar, the biodiversity COP is still in uh, April, May, but we know it is unlikely official announcement will come after the session is closed in March. Their expectation is sometime in August, September. Uh, meanwhile, we are expecting to have the desertification COP in Abidjan in, in the middle of May. And we are checking with the Secretariat what will be the agenda for us uh, to engage in that. It is still not clear the modalities there, virtual or, or hybrid. Um, and of course, uh, this will also be very important for Africa because Africa is hosting two out of three COPs in their continent. Uh, so position of African nations are important, how to make the connection. So we will be playing a role. The advantage, of course, is that Minister Fouad, uh, Minister of Environment of Egypt, was the president of COP20, uh, COP14, uh, and, and she's now playing an active role um, in the, the 
climate cop so that is also giving us huge opportunities to build on uh so let's see let's see how things will evolve um and in the middle of the year we will also celebrate stockholm plus 50 and uh, this will be a two days event in stockholm with uh, unep but also city of stockholm will also have some special events um, and throughout the year, we will be strongly engaged in the design of the new way of mechanisms into the UN system by the UN Secretary General through the collaboration with the task force on future of cities, where ICLE and all the local governments are engaged through the global task force of local and governments, which we are prominently expecting that there will be, a, this will also open a new way of practice and culture of multi-level action in the UN space. So. Uh, definitely a busy calendar. While um, talking, uh, while listening to Ingrid, uh, there was uh, feedback from Carl about the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, which I have inserted now into the calendar again. And this was one of the reasons, in fact, why we have asked Ralga to be uh, part of the um, Cochrane Second Preparations Working Group. Uh, we will check with Ladislas, the Secretary General. Uh, so that we formulate uh, how exactly Ralga will be involved, so that Ralga can and Commonwealth Local Government Forum definitely could be the bridge between the Commonwealth Local Government Forum in June to COP process in 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 by uh, uh, in Sharm El Sheikh. So, Carl, thanks for the alert on that. Um, Ingrid shared the link and. Um, Kobe has, has shared her remarks. Um, uh, exactly. She, so one thing uh, in our mailings, once again, we will share the, the process in, in, in Geneva. Um, I think uh, Ingrid, it will also be good if we can add one more slide on cities with nature and regions with nature so that it is very clear because this is officially in the text you have mentioned it but it will be good to have, give visibility you may recall cities with regions started cities with nature started a bit earlier regions with nature was launched in october this year in in 2021 and it was prominently announced at the cop uh, in in glasgow with scottish government at the multi-level action pavilion as as ingrid mentioned we unfortunately could not get the full endorsement of the UK COP26 presidency for Edinburgh, but UK in the biodiversity process is fully behind this process. So that's exactly an example of the need for synergy between the processes, the secretariats. Uh, for example, uh, in the CBD, we are enjoying a huge support from Oliver Hillel. Uh, he is particularly focusing on the, the biodiversity subnational agenda. And there is really a keen interest to invite both the certification and others to create the, the Edinburgh moment in their processes. Um, and I, I would like to encourage us, if, if we go back to our um, uh, slides uh, of our roadmap in, in Sharm El Sheikh, let's remember these kind of things additional texts, additional new paragraph, additional new program depends on how ministerial sessions are designed. So if we can have a climate and urbanization ministerial in Sharm el Sheikh, if we can have strong discussion on food, if we can have strong discussions on nature, it's not impossible to expect a spatial work program on urbanization as a result of COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. This is it's, it's very hard, but it's not impossible. It all depends how we work with the presidency and, of course, the parties. Um, so uh, let's make sure that the positive outcomes from Geneva, uh, from, from Kunming, from Abidjan, will all help us to come to, Kun, to Sharm el Sheikh with a much stronger, with a lot of ammunition in our bags, with a lot of inspiration, so that these processes can come and speak at Sharm el Sheikh that, yes, in Glasgow, you accepted multi-level. Here is how we are doing this in our space. And we want you to make it even more stronger in the climate space. So that, I think, would be type of discussion we would continue to, to build on further in the next weeks and months. Uh, Carl is explaining one more, just to clarify, June is into formal intergovernmental commonwealth 
prime ministers, yes, President Summers, yes, we have made that this is the CLGF summit. Uh, sorry, this is the Commonwealth summit. And within the Commonwealth summit, there is uh, a CLGF summit, which is the local government's forum. Um, so, uh, Carl and Ladislas, Ladislas is not in our call today, but we're in touch with him regularly. It would be great if you can send us the, the links or information so that we feed into our document and presentations. Um, Ingrid, in case you have any points after my remarks that you, th you thought missing or, or needed, feel free. If not, we can go back to our partners. Obviously, we, have, we are seeing that people are starting to leave, uh, probably because they have already their own um, conflicting events. Um, uh, but uh, for those who are with us, feel free to raise your points either on the topics that Ingrid has mentioned or the topics that we have discussed on the climate space. I see no points raised for today. Um, Ingrid, you will join us in the afternoon, isn't it, Zoe? Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. So we will continue in the afternoon with the Western Hemisphere and uh, we will share the links and updates um, from our side, we will be circulating once again, especially uh, the, the, the urgent, the priority topics in the UNFC space is the submissions. Um, so I would like to encourage all our partners to consider how they can contribute. We will circulate this. As I said, we are late on adaptation goal submission, but it's not the end of the world. We can live with a late submission. Uh, I know Regions 4 wants to lead on that. I know Capital Development Fund agreed to lead our work on Article 6.8. So at this stage, since this is at the beginning of the space, this process, just one page is even enough. We don't have to make long documents. Uh, just one page is even enough. Um, so let's aim that we catch up the 28th of February submissions. And meanwhile, once we hear once, we, once the Egyptian delegation is back from Bonn, back to Cairo, let's uh, discuss how we would be working with the, the presidency team. Uh, and let's also follow up with the UK COP26 presidency regarding uh, additional seats for local engineering governments in the Friends of COP for this year. I think these are the to-do lists that we have in our hands so far. Um, and uh, once again, we'd like to thank you all for your kind interaction and kind attention and support. Um, let's uh, wish you all a nice day and an evening, uh, and we'll connect again soon. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.